Entrepreneurs are known as hardworking and passionate. It's not uncommon for an entrepreneur to work 60 to 80 hours per week. Anna Soboski, owner of Breads from Anna, knows this story all too well. Before she started a bread mix company, she grew up in the Iowa City area, the daughter of two hardworking entrepreneurs. I was born on a farm and uh, my parents moved to Iowa City when I was, I think, three. And um, my dad had been sick, he'd had TB, so he had to quit farming. And he had a high school diploma, but no other kind of formal education. And the only job he could get was at the veterans hospital as a janitor. And so with, uh, shortly after me, a total of five kids to raise, um, he started taking on additional work. As soon as we could, we were going to work with him after school. And um, all of us kind of joke that our extracurricular activity was work. You know, that you know, we didn't go out for sports, really. We didn't really do anything but work. And uh, my dad kind of ex kept expanding what he was doing, and my mom was his partner. Eventually, her parents opened a cleaning service, then a cleaning supply company, then a flooring company, and the list goes on. Anna had very little interest in any of her parents' businesses and all of the hard work. Instead, she studied art, and in her 30s, she landed her dream job as an art professor on the East Coast. I got a job up in Boston, and I lived in Providence, and I had this pretty horrible commute. And then um, I started to get sick, and I didn't know what was wrong, and I had this rash all over my skin. And I went to a dermatologist, and um, he said, does anyone in your family have celiac disease? I was like, well, no, what's that? He said, you can't eat gluten. And I said, well, what's that? And uh, so that's when uh, the celiac journey started. Gluten is a protein found in wheat, barley, and rye. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disorder where the ingestion of gluten leads to damage in the small intestine. It is estimated to affect one out of every 100 people worldwide. Anna decided it was time for a change, not only in her eating habits, but also in her life. And so I thought, I'm gonna to go to cooking school in New York City. <laughs> so I called this school that I had known about, and the philosophy of the school was all about how food can heal. And um, so I went to this cooking school and I said, I want to do gluten free. And they're like, what? What's gluten free? Nobody, you know, nobody needs gluten free. And I said, you just wait. This is, this is going to be big. While in school, Anna perfected a gluten free bread recipe. I stayed in New York for a year or so after school and um, decided to come back to Iowa just for the summer. I got here and I just kind of fell in love with it. I felt totally different about it. It was quiet, I could think. You know, when you're in New York or a larger metropolitan area, it's just boom, 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 constant stimulation. Let's go do this, let's go do that. And um, when I was here, I was reading more. I could kind of just think more. It was more about being focused. So I decided to stay. Anna moved to Iowa City and started her gluten-free bread mix company. Her brother had taken over their parents' carpet business and had agreed to let her use a space above his store to start her business. And here I was, 40 years old, and I'm living above my brother's store. And I'm thinking, wow, this is kind of cool space, kind of New York lofty, you know. And I had put up pegboard and put all my pots and pans, and I'm thinking, I'm Julia Childs with my pegboard. And one time a customer came into my brother's store, and I hear this little knock-knock. I mean, this space was tiny. I could reach up and touch the ceiling, and I'm 5'3". And um, it's somebody I went to high school with. And I said, wow, hi, you know. She's like, what, what are you doing here? I was like, well, this is where I live. She's like, and you know, I could tell she thought I was completely crazy. It was kind of a, an important moment that I'm just gonna have to be comfortable with people thinking I'm like really weird and really out there. I also had the realization that I was built more like my parents than I thought, because even when I was teaching 
I wasn't just taking a paycheck and going home. I was thinking about those kids, thinking about projects. So I was always uh, kind of wired to um, <clears throat> kind of reinvent the wheel a little bit. After years of experimenting with recipes, Anna finally had a bread mix that tasted like real bread. She sold the mix on her website and a few local stores, but she knew she needed to expand her exposure outside of Iowa. So she started to travel to celiac trade shows across the country. When I first started doing these, you know, a good turnout would be 100 people. Um, and then they started growing to 500, and then 1,000, and then 5,000. I mean, it just kept growing and growing. So I, my first big show was in Portland, Oregon. And of course, I had no idea what I was doing. So I ship an entire pallet of product to the hotel. So I get out there, they can't find it. <laughs> so uh, my sister from Seattle came down to help me. And some other people who had were also in the business, they're like, you did what? You shipped a whole pallet? You know, and I was like, yeah. Well, how much did you bring? They're like, three cases, you know. So I sold almost the whole pallet. It reinvigorated me and I came back and uh, really started developing more products and uh, moved to my first warehouse. Anna didn't need a big space because up until this point, all of Anna's bread mixes were assembled by a co-packer. All of the mixes were Anna's recipes and the co-packer mixed and packaged the ingredients. And it got to the point where I was like a sales rep for this co-packer. I was working really, really hard, traveling to shows, selling, 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 and paying the co-packer a lot of money. And the co-packer would make mistakes. So I paid for those mistakes. So I decided in 2009, um, I had to figure out a way to bring the manufacturing in-house. It's not a complicated procedure. You just source the dry ingredients, you blend them, and you pack it. I moved from the small warehouse I was at to a larger space and set up the manufacturing. In 2011, Anna's competition began to heat up. As gluten-free became more popular, bigger companies started producing gluten-free products. I used to go to these shows and I was kind of the hit of the party. And all of a sudden, you know, some of these big companies are basically taking up a city block of the shows and giving stuff away, just handing it out. And so people would come up to my booth, well, what's for free? And I'm like, well, nothing. <laughs> you know, it costs a lot to manufacture this. And so I knew uh, I needed to either really grow this because it was going to be way, way too tough to keep going where I was. And at that point, I really had days where I just was like, what have I done with my life? This is crazy, crazy, crazy. I can't keep up with these bills. I, uh, I'm just working nonstop. I have, I mean, this is my whole life and I'm not I'm just keeping my head above water. I, I mean, I can't remember a time where this didn't happen, where I'd be like, I can't do this. And the phone would ring and it would be like someone saying, don't ever go out of business, literally. I'm sitting there thinking I'm gonna go out of business and they're saying, don't ever go out of business. I don't know what my family would do without your products. And I would just hang up the phone and say, okay, Pay the shipping bill <laughs> and I would just you know I would just keep going and it um, it really helped. Anna reached out for more help. She went to the Entrepreneurial Development Center in Cedar Rapids and asked them to help her raise money and they did. The new team decided to spend heavily on marketing trying to match her competition's efforts. It was it was a both an exciting you know, time and a frustrating time because we were spending money, a lot of money, and we still weren't getting results. We decided that what the business needed was a team of people who had really specific 
experience at growing a business in the food industry who really understood um, this particular category, its growth and its potential. And um, we found those people. Anna's new partners have a lot of experience in marketing in the food industry, allowing Anna to focus on what she is passionate about. You know, it was hard for me to charge people for the products. I just, I wanted them to have them. I wanted them to enjoy them. I wanted them to say, wow, this is like real bread. This has the taste, the texture, the nutrition of real bread. That's all I cared about was like getting celiacs to have that experience or people who couldn't eat gluten. And um, that was my fault. That was my, my sort of weakness is that I wasn't focused enough on making money. And, um, you know, it takes a balance. It takes a quality product to make money, but it takes, you know, charging what you need to charge for that quality product to keep the product alive. When Anna was young, she wanted an easier life full of adventure. But in the end, it was the passion she had for her product that led her to entrepreneurship and drew her back to Iowa and back to her family. Looking back, she can now appreciate all the hard work that her parents put into their business because she is doing the same thing with hers now. I always admired my parents. I was never one of those teenage kids who would, you know, run out and just complain about their parents. I never, ever remember doing that because I knew how hard they worked. I realized that there were rewards for that hard work. I mean, we really felt like a unit, a team, uh, working towards this. And, you know, I learned that um, <clears throat> there was a lot of pride in doing a job well done, no matter what the job was. You know, that there was a lot of nobility in emptying garbage cans, and there was a lot of nobility in selling furniture. I mean, no matter what it was, all work was um, worthwhile. And that you do a good job because it matters that it was done well, not because somebody else is going to see that you did a good job. Just east of I-35 and less than 20 miles south of Mason City is the town of Sheffield. This small town with a population of just over 1,000 people is home to a not-so-small company, Sukup Manufacturing. Sukup employs about 600 people and is the lifeblood that keeps the Sheffield community alive. Sukup Manufacturing, a grain bin and grain dryer manufacturer, has called Sheffield home since 1963. The whole story begins with Eugene Sukup, a Nebraska-born farm kid who moved to Iowa on the heels of the Dust Bowl. I was born in Nebraska in the Dust Bowl days. Things were not good in those days. My family couldn't make it out there. So we came to Iowa. Well, they moved to Iowa in 1938. I went to school in Dumont down here. I wasn't exactly welcome there. The kids there said, we're going to send you back to Nebraska in a uh, boxcar. Well, uh, it just gives you the grit to uh, uh, go to work and uh, make things better. Eugene grew up to be a farmer raising hogs and growing corn. At the same time, corn was predominantly harvested on the ear and dried in corn cribs. On his quest to make things better, Eugene was very innovative. So it should come at no surprise that he was one of the first in the area to purchase a grain bin to store shelled corn. We bought a, a grain bin, filled it with corn, and uh, about uh, in January or so, we found that it wasn't uh, drying on top. Because at that time, you had smaller fans on your bins, and it takes heat and air to dry. This is the one thing that we've known and the air was just not getting through the bin. So, and I had a crust on top of the bin, a couple of inches thick, and consequently, you get up there with a shovel and it's pretty hard work. And you know, in those days as farmers, we liked to work and that was great. The grain developed hot spots and was crusted on top. 
The grain on the bottom of the bin was dry because of the fan. The grain needed to be mixed so that it could dry evenly. At the time, the only way to do that was with a shovel. Eugene thought there had to be a better way, so he invented a handheld electric auger. We took this auger and hung it by a chain. Then we had to get electric cord and drag it up the top of the bin. We'd hang it there and it would cut its way around and it was much easier than shoveling with a shovel to uh, keep the corn in condition up there. And that's the way we started stirring grain back in 1962. Eugene's invention worked so well that he thought he could sell it to other farmers. Like most farmers, once you think you've got an idea out there, you want to run with it. So consequently, I made about 30 of those augers and uh, took them down to Stockdale's, who is a large uh, bin dealer down here for Stormore, and uh, said, hey, wouldn't you like to uh, try this? Well, uh, we had bought our grain bin from Stockdale's, so like a lot of dealers, they felt very obligated to <laughs> humor this guy with uh, an idea. So he said he'd buy five of them. So he took five of them. And uh, I went back there uh, about uh, six weeks later and uh, he just shook his head and he said, I sold three out of that bunch. And uh, one I've never heard with, one guy brought it back and said he never wanted to see it again. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the other fellow, he evidently kept uh, dragging it up to the top of the bin and working with it. And Stockdale sh shook his head and said, I don't want any more of those. You've got to come up with a better idea. Not to be defeated, Eugene went home that night with a new problem to solve. So I went to home, slept on it that night, and I came up with the idea of hanging that auger in a bin and uh, putting another auger through the handle of the drill and moving it back and forth in the bin. And then you had your permanent electricity in there. Now the first one sold for 30 bucks, 29.95 actually. And the first one we made automatically came to $695. Well, being a tight farmer, I didn't think it was, you know, that's a lot of money to spend for something. But as it turns out, other farmers didn't think it was expensive. Sukup's new grain auger not only stirred the corn on top, it circulated the grain throughout the bin. Since the corn on top and bottom would dry at the same rate, there'd be no more spoiled corn. Sukup Manufacturing was born. And uh, to think that we came up with that auger in 1962, and we still sell thousands of them today, yeah. It's unbelievable that something would be around that long. Slowly, Eugene phased out of farming and focused his attention on Sukup manufacturing. Eventually, his two sons, Charles and Steve, would join the company. Dad evidently thought it would be uh, cheaper or better to raise an engineer than hire one because the, it was always uh, growing up that, uh, well, I'd go take ag engineering and that was always my uh, assumption to go to Iowa State and take agricultural engineering. I know some of the uh, professors at school would say, oh gee, how's it going back to your dad's company? Can you get him to move forward and progress like things should happen? <laughs> that was never a problem. Dad was always looking forward. He, uh, he, he's never looking backward. Charles took over as president in 95 and Steve serves as the chief financial officer. Sukup Manufacturing was doing well, but the brothers wanted to grow the business. Most grain bin manufacturers didn't make augers or dryers, so Sukup held a substantial part of the market. But that would all change in the late 90s. Finally, they decided that they were going to build their own sweep augers, their own fans, and uh, their other uh, equipment, grain spreaders, and consequently, they didn't need us anymore. And so we decided we had to get into the grain bin business. The idea for making grain bins had been on the Sukup family's radar for a number of years. We uh, got into the bin business, but we came in from it totally different than every other bin company. All the rest of the bin companies out there had started rolling steel sheets and then the accessories like the fans and the heaters and the floors were kind of an afterthought or in the stirring machines. And so we got into making the accessories. 
but this was a case where we were kind of having to burn the boats that brought us here because a number of our customers were these other uh, bin companies, but we were getting squeezed out. And so we needed to stay in control and take control of our destiny. So we began making grain bins. Since they would be new to grain bins, they needed to find a way to separate themselves from the competition. The equipment that they would use would be a major factor. Our first uh, question was, do we buy equipment that's used? We could get some very cheap. We had been used to buying at auctions and uh, dad with, and mom with a depression background being very frugal with the money. Or do we buy new advanced equipment? We went with brand new equipment, uh, the most advanced equipment that there was in uh, making grain bins. Yet again, the Sukups decided to be innovative and they purchased state-of-the-art equipment. Not only did this make them more efficient, it made their products better. Adding grain bins to their product line catapulted them to the top of the grain bin market. So the portable dryers turned, started turning the car and then with the grain bins, it was like, okay, we've got the, we got the start of the full package. We've grown uh, seven times larger since uh, uh, 2000, and uh, staying state-of-the-art has been key. Even at 87, Eugene still comes to work every day with his wife, Mary. As Mary looks back, she knows that her husband's accomplishments are something special, and it wasn't an easy road to find their success. That is one of the things that I admire about him and his true ability because he started out with an idea. Just the idea is a wonderful thing, but there's a lot goes into it before it is a successful product in the market. And Eugene did that. Eugene Sukup grew up a poor farm kid with a passion for doing things better. What he didn't realize is that being innovative is a big part of being an entrepreneur. By coming up with a solution for his own problems of drying grain, he has helped millions of farmers across the country. After half a century in business, Eugene still comes to work with a smile, loving what he has created. You can't believe that, uh, you know, somebody can be in business 54 years and uh, still be here to hear about it. and enjoy what I'm doing. I enjoy every minute of it. I still come to work and it, it's, it's fun doing it. And having my family around me and they're doing such a great job. We've got some great talent here and uh, the uh, company continues to grow, which is great.